Hello, my name is Professor Jean Ann Corvia. I'm at the University of Texas at Austin. And today I will discuss implementing advanced biological functions in artificial magnetic neurons and synapses for energy efficient radiation hard computing. Uh, feel free to email me at my email in Corvia Austin at UTexas at ADU. And you can also check out my website, Integrated Nano Computing Lab. I would like to start out by acknowledging the students and collaborators who have contributed to the projects and our funding from Sandia National Laboratories and the National Science Foundation. I will begin by discussing the Domain Wall Magnetic Tunnel Junction Computing Element and our prototypes. I will then discuss one example advanced biological function, which is called lateral inhibition. This is one of, of a number of advanced biological functions we have investigated for these devices. And I will then discuss the radiation analysis of the film stack for high radiation environments. We are, aware, we are well aware of uh, problems with traditional computing when performing data intensive tasks. There is a memory wall between compute and memory. There is energy loss while computers are idle. And there is an additional wall between analog and digital conversion. And these, among other problems, uh, make us look to new materials that could perhaps um, perform new, these types of new data tested tasks better. So magnetic materials are one particular candidate for energy efficient um, beyond binomial computing uh, because they have low write energy and write time compared to other emerging resistive memories. They are non-volatile. They are back end of the line compatible. They are known to be robust to radiation. And in particular, they have complex features that can be mapped onto new systems, such as main wall dynamics, oscillatory behavior, and magnetic straight field interactions. So the device that I'm focusing on here is called the three terminal domain wall magnetic tunnel junction or domain wall MTJ. And this is a picture of what the device looks like, where there is a pattern wire made out of heavy metal and then a ferromagnet and then magnesium oxide on top. And in the, in the ferromagnet, the cobalt iron born here, there is a domain wall, this white region here, which we can move back and forth across this wire by applying a current between the in and the clock terminal. We can then read out the resistance state of the device through a tunnel junction shown by this pattern blue disk. So we have built these prototypes down to 250 nanometer feature sizes. This is a top-down SCM images where you can see the domain wall track of width W and the magnetic tunnel junction in the center. You can see we have this additional electrode um, on the left, which we call an Ersted field line. And as I'll show you, will allow us to uh, control the variability in these devices. So these films were grown by applied materials and then patterned at UT Austin. And please see on this paper for more details on the prototypes. So our prototypes are able to overcome some of the major challenges that we were facing with these dream wall magnetic tunnel, jun magnetic tunnel junction devices. And that can really allow them now to enter the realm of uh, building circuits. So um, the first major challenge is the patterning um, can degrade both the tunnel magnet resistance and the resistance area product of the unpatterned film. And here we've shown that after patterning, all four devices here have um, average tunnel magnet resistance 164%, um, very close to the unpatterned film TMR, and the resistance area product of 31 ohm micrometer squared, also very close to the unpatterned RA. And here is an example um, resistance of the tunnel junction versus fields of the four devices. Another major impediment we've overcome is the variability. So by including the resistor field line, we can precisely control the initialization of the stream wall position with current. And then we can um, switch using a current then through the wire. And so here's an example of 10 cycles where we reinitialize this domain wall um, with this ERSA field line after every cycle. And we get a variation around 7%. Uh, we also get a switching current density around 10 to 7 amps per centimeter squared. Uh, this is also a big improvement over previous devices that use in-plane anisotropy and spin transfer torque. Here we have perpendicular magnetic anisotropy and we use spin orbit torque to switch this domain wall, uh, which greatly reduces the switching current density down to values that are reasonable and won't burn the devices. Um, 
we can put this vari variation of 7% into our simulation of a full adder, and this would correspond to around 96% accuracy of a full adder. So by a better control of this drain wall motion and by using current to control the drain wall position, uh, we can start to actually implement circuits. And for more information about the simulation of the adder, please see this paper from 2019. So now that you have a brief introduction to these Dwayne Wallman and tunnel junctions, I want to go into one example of advanced biological function they could have, which is called lateral inhibition. So these Dwayne Wallman and tunnel junctions can be applied to in-memory computing and also to neuromorphic computing, and we can design them to act as both neurons and synapses. So here I'm just going to focus on the neurons, uh, but you can read some of our work on synapses as well. So for neurons, um, we want them to represent a leaky integrating fire type neuronal model where if you have a neuron it will obtain a signal and the signal will cause it to integrate until it eventually fires and then if there's no signal the neuron should relax back to its original state. So we can implement this in our Dwayne magnetic tunnel junctions by offsetting, offsetting the MTJ to one side of the device such that when we apply our current between in and clock, the drain wall moves and that's integration and when it passes the tunnel junction, that's firing. And we can see this here in our micromagnetic simulations of drain wall position versus time. When we apply it current, the, the drain wall translates along. And then um, when we take away the current, we can have leaking of the drain wall back to its original state. And this can be achieved either through uh, a DC magnetic field or through uh, anisotropy gradients. So um, this Dwayne MTJ neuron can have inherent lateral inhibition if we start to make use of the stray magnetic field interactions between the neurons. So lateral inhibition is an important neuronal feature found in biology where neurons that are winning out can impede the firing of nearby neurons. This helps um, to reduce errors in, in processing of information. And so we can imagine our dream wall tracks aligned like this. And in this instance, the center neuron has its dream wall farthest ahead. So this one is the one that's firing and winning out. And we want it to impede the firing or the motion of these dream walls in the nearby wires. So it's important to note that lateral inhibition is a well-known um, feature, and today it's been implemented using bulky additional CMOS circuitry, um, which has shown to have a lot of advantages, but it takes a lot of area up in the, uh, in the circuit. And so our main accomplishment here is really uh, making use of this at a device inherent level. So um, just to elucidate what's going on a little more, if we have two side-by-side Dwayne wall track neurons. Uh, this neuron N has the Dwayne wall farther ahead, so it's going to have some magnetic field that can impede the Dwayne wall in the left neuron from firing. So what we find is that uh, we can tune both the device and material parameters to really uh, set this inhibition and really maximize it. So um, this is simulations of 50 nanometer wide wires. Um, here's them side by side. And if you look at the velocity of, of neuron 2's drain wall compared to the spacing between the wires, uh, first of all, if we don't include inhibition in our, in our simulation, then we just get this dotted line here. When we include inhibition, then we get um, this curve here, and we can see two distinct regions. Um, in this blue region, we see processional motion of neuron 2 as it moves, so it's above Walker breakdown. And in um, this red region, we see steady state no motion. So by tuning this wire spacing, we can get this sweet spot between uh, processional and steady state motion, which drastically reduces this velocity and inhibits it. So here's just four snapshots of four different spacings. And we can see clearly in non-inhibited versus inhibited, there's a sweet spot here at 90 nanometer spacing. And so it's important to note that uh, we can achieve inhibition with quite large widths of the wires and quite large spacing. So we don't know, need to go down to super, um, super, super nanoscale size. So we can define the lateral inhibition as this difference in velocity, and therefore we can achieve versus wire spacing lateral inhibition up to 75% here. Uh, and we've been able to further optimize the materials properties to get up to 90% lateral inhibition. 
So um, that was discussing two wires, but we can also uh, have inhibition with an array of neurons, which is how we would eventually use this inner circuit. So here we have an array of these dwemel MTJ neurons and two spacings, S1 and S2, defined between them. And so by tuning S1 and S2, um, here we, we took a simulation of a thousand side-by-side -side neurons of different velocities of the domain walls, and we ranked them from slowest to fastest. And so the intrinsic domain wall velocities are shown here in blue, and then when we include inhibition, we can see this orange curve here. So we see that all the slower domain walls got their velocity drastically reduced, while the faster domain walls did not get reduced in the velocity, and those neurons will be allowed to fire. So this is a soft winner-take-all. And uh, we can implement this in um, image clustering tasks. So I'm just going to briefly discuss this so you can see this paper here for more information. But here we um, did an MNIST test classification accuracy versus um, the coupling constant of, constant of lateral inhibition. So going from weak coupling to strong, where only the farthest ahead wins. And so we actually find a sweet spot where this soft winner take all is um, most useful and really improves the classification accuracy. Okay, in my last minute, I just want to briefly discuss that we've also done radiation analysis on this exact film stack that was used in these prototypes. Um, so uh, one big application of these magnetic devices, like I've mentioned, is for radiation hard environments like space. And uh, there's different types of radiation. Here we focused on tantalum heavy iron radiation. And we looked at the ton tunnel junction stack and uh, analyzed it for different fluences of radiation. Uh, from non-radiated up to 10 to the 14 ions per centimeter squared. And we analyzed after radiation the adiplane magnetic hysteresis loop using magneto optical Kerr effect, or MOC. And so you can see here that the non-irradiated have uh, an up to um, 1 times 10 to the 12 have very um, good adiplane anisotropy. We don't see any change in the magnetic behavior. Um, so we can conclude that these devices are very robust to radiation. But we can apply high enough heavy ions to reduce this radiation and eventually, sorry, to reduce this anisotropy. And eventually we see that the permanent anisotropy goes away and the magnetization goes in plane. And we can see this clearly here where the depending, um, sorry, the remnants magnetization and the cursive field both go down for these very high fluences. We can also see this here in this white light moak uh, that at the very high fluences we no longer have the out of plane domains. So I'm um, just a um, brief, um, for more information please see our um, conference presentation and a paper that's going to come up very soon on the subject. Uh, we analyzed for these different doses in transition uh, in TEM and we can see from the no dose to the very high doses um, just as a quick conclusion, we get the introduction of this cobalt iron oxide interlayer for intermixing of the free layer and the MGO. And in particular, I want to emphasize that uh, for these doing well MTJs, a unique feature of them is that we need the free layer on the bottom and we need it close to this heavy metal tantalum layer. And we, we notice that both of those um, requirements does make it slightly higher, slightly more susceptible to radiation at these super high doses, while we can conclude that they are very radiation hard. Okay, so I will conclude there. Um, please read the conclusions here, and you can see these particular three papers for more information. Thank you for your time and for listening.